Anyway, we we're just throwing this in the middle um, <clears throat> as we uh, yeah, celebrate. Yeah, ohano hano keila nui, o kia puni mo i o Hawaii, o yo i kala ku o koa, e mana o ano wau e hane wahi hai o lelo no ka mo o lelo o keia aina o Hawaii nei no lela aloha. Anyway, we have a real short, uh, brief, maybe for an hour or so. I'm going to run real quickly to a bunch of stuff, and I just kind of wanted to um, share a little bit in honor of La Kuokoa, and really in honor of uh, the re-educating of our Lahui Kanaka, and the reawakening of our Lahui Kanaka. Uh, I would like to just share a little bit of uh, some of the things I teach in my courses, and uh, especially looking at history. And understanding the role of history, and of course, understanding it's a good example of how the most important celebration, holiday during the Hawaiian Kingdom, uh, quickly in a few generations, was almost erased from the memories of our people. And in fact, it's only in the last decade or so that it's become uh, growing. Strong and strong. In fact, I, I was uh, telling a story. I remember, uh, this is you know 25 years ago. Maybe there was like eight of us gathered for a small gathering to uh, recognize La Ho'i Ho'ia. So anyway, just gonna start. I'm gonna roll. Title of my uh, uh, lecture here: Uamau Kea O Kaine Kapono. And as you can take a look at this little kii here, maybe not gonna be the best. So if you cannot see, you might have to move up so you can see some of the pictures I'm gonna show. But of course, if you look at this. Uh, cartoon that was printed in the newspapers in the early uh, 1900s, right after the so-called uh, fake annexation of the Hawaiian Islands. You can see through the images here, you see uh, Uncle Sam, of course, lecturing in front. Right in the front row, you can see uh, from the Philippines, Cuba, Puerto Rico, and of course, Hawaii, all being lectured to by the great so-called Uncle Sam. And if you look back in the classroom, you notice, of course, the names of the various so-called states of the United States all studying hard as part of the classrooms. So it kind of gives you an idea of how the United States actually looked at various peoples, especially non-white peoples at this time. Of course, the brownies, including the Hawaiians, Puerto Ricans, uh, people from Guam and um, the Philippines, of course, needed to be lectured to. Uh, and if you take a look, and if you look way in the left-hand corner, anybody see what you see in the left-hand corner? What's going on back there? On window cleaner, who's that window cleaning? Yeah, when, when today we call African American. Yeah, who is, as you can see, while well, everybody's in the classroom, look at how they see and portray even African Americans back then. You know, their job, of course, was to like be almost like the labor or the help within the household. And if you look in the middle corner back there, you guys know, right, right inside of the door, what's going on? An Indian, and what is the Indian doing? reading a book, and you can't really see here, but if you look carefully, you would notice the Indians actually reading the book upside down. And again, suggesting the idea that, you know, kind of wasting the education is so-called civilized heathens, and they never really go and learn to become so-called great people. And if you look outside the door, you see somebody outside the door. Who's that? You guys can see. That's the Chinese, the parquet. And you notice that the Chinese, what is the Chinese trying to do? Trying to sneak into this so-called classroom. Again, in those days, they talked about what's called the yellow peril, this idea, this fear of the foreigner at the door. Again, stories haven't changed that much, if you really understand what's going down today. This is really the same story being told over and over. So we think about history, you always got to frame it in this understanding of what the United States was like in 1900. And I would probably suggest not that much different in 2018. But we start off in understanding, even from the Hawaiian perspective of history, through Mele, like the Kumulipo, our own cosmogony. When our kupuna talked about where we come from, when we began as a people, we began, in fact, when the stars themselves began, the cosmos. And so our consciousness of a people didn't begin in our storytelling, in our narrative in 1776. It didn't begin in 1 AD. It didn't begin 5000 BC. But in our stories, from the beginning of the stars themselves, the cosmos themselves, who are seen as being ancestors, so began this great story. So one of the things you see, just philosophically, how we see ourselves as a people. We are, of course, connected to everything that has come before us, even to, of course, the beginning of the stars. Now, scientifically, we should realize that's all true. Yeah, all of us here, every part of us here, 
Every physical piece of us, all of us, whether brown, black, yellow, or purple, are all made up of all the same matter and chemical and chemistry that began, of course, with the cosmos themselves. So you can see our kupuna had a real strong understanding of really, really, truly who our kupuna are. We have other cosmogenies. Of course, many of us know the story of Haloa and Haloa Nakalau Kapalili, yeah, children of Wakea and Hohoku Kalani. Yeah? But of course, this also gives us a particular story or narrative which provides the idea of how we, as the Kanaka, the Haloa Kanaka, we have this familial, yeah, familial relationship with the land around us. You know, we don't have a role to be the dominator, have dominion over all living things, as, as it said in Genesis in the Bible. Instead, we, in fact, are part of all living things. And we are, in fact, relatives. And in the Kumulipo and other stories, in fact, we are the last chapter in this great story. We are the youngest of the siblings in this so-called family. We just also understand scientifically when they talk about the migrations and settlements. Yeah, we always understood in our stories, I've always said in our uh, you know, from our kupuna that, in fact, we, we migrated here, purposefully settled these lands. Yeah, we didn't just by chance, floating on some logs, kind of just happen to cross the Pacific Ocean, which covers a third of this planet. That, in fact, our ancestors were the so-called astronauts of their time. They come from the people who had the greatest moves. In fact, if you look at historic history, in fact, you look at genetic evidence. Polynesians are interesting people genetically that we come from. When you look into the mitochondrial DNA, we come from the latest, the last great migrations actually to come out of Africa. Only about, you know, less than 15,000 years ago who left uh, Africa and actually went up north. They went all up north above places like Iraq, Iran, and came out above um, Nepal and, um, uh, you know, that area. And then came down uh, through Asia, through China, eventually went through uh, places like, um, let's see my brain, sorry. <laughs> what we call Taiwan today. And from Taiwan entered into the Western Pacific, and they joined up with a people that actually was already there. Yeah, and I mean already there, these are some of the earliest, in fact, not the earliest people to migrate, in fact, out of Africa. And those kupuna, very ancient, they say even maybe as much as 100,000 years ago, maybe 80,000 years, years ago, left Africa, made their way more south, and came across in, uh, what we would call India today, and came down to what is now known as Southeast Asia. And those people, of course, later made it with those who came up uh, from up north. And the Polynesians, about three, 4,000 years ago, in the hub of what becomes Polynesia, Samoa, Tonga, and, and Fiji, this proto-Polynesian society develops and culture and religion develops and worldview develops there. And then about 2,000 years ago, there was another last great migration that left those lands, and which began the great migrations and settlement of all the rest of the Pacific. And not just the Pacific, but actually, if you look now, you'll find that they find DNA evidence, of course, that Polynesians, in fact, made it way all the way to the Americas, way before there was even a, a, a person named Columbus walking around out there. And so we come from a people who were the movers. They were the first to move out of Africa and the last to move out of Africa. It's kind of in our DNA, in a sense, to always be looking into the future horizon. <clears throat> And of course, we should realize we, the people of this land, these islands, right in the center of the Pacific Ocean, one third of the planet is covering this place. So we come from an ocean people in the middle of this great ocean, the crossroads of the Pacific, the most remotest place in the world. It was our kupuna who traveled and traversed, taking all the necessary things of life, purposely settling the Pacific and ending up in these islands. So we think about, again, Kanaka. Who are we as Kanaka? We really are a culmination and, and mixing and, uh, of different periods of time and different migrations. And actually, even for Polynesians, when you look at our Mo'olelo, we find in our stories, we had been settled in different times and different people in po Polynesia itself. You can see exactly, you can see and look at the Maui stories, for example, and see how we connect to the people of Tonga. We can see even from our stories, the island itself, Hawaii. The largest island in this chain is Hawaii. Of course, we know our direct cousin, the largest island in the Samoan Islands is Savai'i. In Savai'i, they have a large, uh, uh, you know, um, district, yeah? Ta'u. Yeah, you go to South District of Hawaii Island, you get Ka'u. We can look at our stories from people from what we call today Marquesas and Nukuhiva. We can look at our stories from Tahiti and people like Moikeha. 
So the, what becomes the Hawaiian people, our ancestors, really are a collection of all these various, even Polynesians who got here. And that's why when you look even at our language, our stories, our mythologies, our religion, we're as complex and more complex than probably any Polynesian also. And that's because they all ended up here too. And so we're really a collection of all of that. And I'd just like to say also, when I, that's why when I, my politics, I've always been one to understand pan-Polynesian pan politics. 99.9% .9 we are all the same Polynesians, you gotta understand, physically, the phenotype. Whether we're Samoan, Tongan, Tahitian, or Hawaiian, or Maori, we're really all physically the same people. And that's a truth, that's a scientific truth. And so our so-called archipelago, which was settled by our people, but really of course in the main Hawaiian islands, down towards the east, yeah, Ko Hawaii Pai Aina, the whole archipelago. And we, of course, we know our major islands that we had. You can see on my, my lectures for students to learn how to pronounce the, the islands here. So I'm going to skip through all of these. But we can look through some of our mo'olelo. You know, one of the mythologies, and I like to talk about mythologies a lot, is that, in fact, oh, you kanaka, you really don't know who came here and when they came here and how they came here. Again, those are all just foolishness. Of course we do. We have our stories. This is one example. This is Opu Kahunua, which is a story of how the migrations got here. Yeah. And I don't have time actually. Sorry, I can't go through all the stories, but you know, we gotta move on. We gotta do a several thousand years in a very quick time, so we gotta move here. Yeah. We have the story of Moikiha that comes from Tahiti, right? Sailing up from Tahiti with his, and he comes sailing up with his great navigator, Maku Maku Kaumana, and the chanter. Kamahualele, who pronounces those words, his famous chant, Eya Hawaii, he moku he kanaka. He kanaka Hawaii, ye he kanaka Hawaii. He kama naka hiki. He puoli imai tapaahu. Mai mo ula nu ya kea kanaloa. And in this recitation of this, what's called a puli wanana, this is a prophecy prayer. So this is when Moekea folks are coming from south, and of course looking upon Hawaii Island, they see Mauna Kea, and he calls out this chant, Here is Hawaii, an island, a people. Kanaka Hawaii, kanaka Hawaii. Royal children, royal offspring of the people of Tahiti. So even, of course, we knew our connections to the outside lands. We can talk about great other uh, figures in our history, people like Pa'au, the great Kahuna Pa'au, when he comes to Hawaii. And in fact, there's a little debate exactly where he comes from. And he says he comes from Kahiki. Other people say he comes from Upolu. One of the confusions of that, of course, we know there were multiple kahikis throughout the Pacific, and there are multiple upolos in the Pacific also. Yeah? Uh, Kalakaua says actually came from places like Samoa. And when he comes, he brings this new kind of very strict, stringent religion, the Aikapu. Not sorry, the Aikapu, the Moi. Yeah, the Kapu Moi. And uh, the Pulo Ulo'u. Human sacrifice. The god Kuka Moku all comes with Pa'au. So a lot of times when we talk about traditional, ancient Hawaiian history, we always talk about pre-Pa'au and post-Pa'au. He plays such an important role in the changes of our people. But in our Hawaiian history, we think about time frames, and many times when I teach, I talk about the pre-Wakia. This is the ancient, ancient stories that we have. And then we have this period between Wakia and Pa'au, right? The pre-Pa'au history. And then you have from Pa'au to the time of Kamehameha, the unification of these islands. And then from Kamehameha, which is the beginning of the Hawaiian kingdom, we have the Hawaiian kingdom period. And of course, the post-Hawaiian kingdom period, when I mean post, I mean the actual uh, um, existence of the, what you might say, the, the, the physical Hawaiian kingdom. So we talk about oh, what is oh, the US occupation and the two periods, of course, the territorial period and what we call today the state of Hawaii period. But first of all, what is history? We gotta understand a little bit what history is. So we get fooled to think in that when you read a history book, you're reading all these facts. And all these facts kind of have this almost like sacred kind of uh, rhythm and sacred kind of connection. And what you actually find when you really study history, you realize history is not in fact based upon facts at all. History is a collection of stories that as I said here, that a lot of people like to agree upon as being true. As the great Robert Seeley says, history is past politics. Yeah, history is what we call past politics. And past politics presents history of today. Yeah. History is politics projected in the past. So you think about issues of today. We think of history of really having meaning in the past, but really history has meaning today. We fight and have contestation of ideas about what happened back then because it matters today. If we look at contemporary issues within the United States, 
For example, the struggle over gun control. When they debate over gun control, how has the past come to inform the discussion of today? What do people look back at? What's the historical event people go back and quote or talk about, about gun control? Yeah, the Second Amendment. So people today are arguing about exactly what the Second Amendment meant. Something that happened over 200 years ago. Yes, and the point I'm trying to make, you can see how past plays a part of always today. We can talk about the rights of Hawaiian people today. We can talk about Mauna Kea today. And people will constantly talk about issues of title, issues of consent, issues of course, there is no treaty of annexation. Issues like why we celebrate La Kua. Yeah, The now is always based upon the re-describing and a lot of times the recontestation of what we're looking at in regards to what we consider facts of the history of the past. In Gugi Wationgo, great Kenyan uh, literary critic, in his great book, Decolonizing the Mind, he talks about what he calls the cultural bomb. And the idea of this cultural bomb is this idea how the so-called occupiers, the settlers, the colonizers, in that process to gain control of peoples that they settled upon or colonized. In order to gain the control, they have to, in a sense, destroy the cultural, political, economic ideologies of the people. And he describes it as this cultural bomb where basically they detonate the minds and hearts of the souls of the people. And as he says in a very ending here, yeah, let me just read to you, Anaila people's belief, a key word, belief, in their names, in their language, in their environment, in their heritage of struggle, in their unity, in their capacities, and ultimately in themselves. It makes them see their past as one wasteland of non-achievement. And I'm sure many of you, just like me, when we were growing up, how many of us ever knew about what happened on November 28, 1843? Virtually none of us. How many of us knew about the so-called QA petitions? Well, I know I went to college, I learned about it. We used to read about it. We used to say, wow, it would be great one day if you could ever find them. And we had friends who used to go out and try and find them, and they couldn't find them. And, you know, back, I think it was in, uh, eight, uh, sorry, 1997, if I remember right. A couple, couple people, like Noi Noi Silva and others, went to uh, D.C., went to the National Archives. And lo and behold, when they requested the box, the box was there. It showed up. And that forever changed the minds of our people. This wasn't just a kind of legendary mythology we heard about. Now you can actually see the names of your kupuna. And so that idea of, I wonder what my kupuna thought about what happened. Was erased from today, from now on. Because now we, can, we know for sure exactly what they thought. It's forever put on paper. See how history changes itself. So we clearly, we clearly now we say we never ever gave consent clearly to what has happened to our people in this land. And the last part, that I like his quote also, he talks about the idea of quote, theft is holy. That this whole process is about teaching us, quote unquote, theft is holy. And the sense that we somehow are going to be like, yeah, all the bad things happened to us was, was the best for us. You lucky Hawaiians. You're lucky the Americans were here when the Japanese bombed Pearl Harbor. Of course, we should have realized that that's the reason they bombed Pearl Harbor was because the Americans had nothing to do with us. You know, you're lucky Hawaiians, you might be speaking a faraway language. <laughs> but you see how that sickness that we pick up, that supremacist is a sickness. It makes us see ourselves as says, something that's less than. Yeah, we get told all the time, oh, you Hawaiians gonna get together. That's bullshit. In 1897, they got together. In the Kuwait petitions, they got together. And as I say, if they did it before, there's no reason we cannot do it again. This is not a journey to somewhere new. This is a journey returning to where we have been before. That's a very different journey. And so we can look at even the stories and mythologies that come to our minds, which I'll talk about here, and I'm sorry you guys can see well. But if you look on the left, you see there's a... What does that depict anyway? Anybody can see? The Adam and Eve. And what's wrong with the Adam and Eve picture over there? That's right, they're white. Now, the joke is really on us, you see, because I can show this picture to any person 95% of the time. That's all, oh, that's Adam and Eve. 
I said, really? And I asked him the story. Oh, the first human beings. And I said, oh, yeah, really? And I, what's wrong with the picture? Um, they're naked. No, uh, she's picking the apple, and they come with all these ideas. And almost never do they ever say, how come they're white? You see, the poison of supremacy is so deep within us. We have taught ourselves to accept these untruths and lies. And the question we got to ask, who does that lie empower? Who does this lie disempower? See, that's the point of understanding history. History isn't just telling some stories. History always has a purpose. It always empowers and it always disempowers. That's why certain things are left out of history and certain things are focused upon in history. There are lies that are stretched and things that are denied because it always empowers and disempowers. And of course, if you look on the right side, you notice that's a Newsweek article. And what do you got on there? Now we got some brownies on there. Because understand today, they know scientifically there is no way the first human beings could have looked like that. It is virtually impossible. But you know what's strange today? Even on this campus, you still get people going, I don't know if I can believe that. They're so inundated with the untruth, you see. As, as the great Franz Fanon and other psychologists talk about what they call about, you know, cognitive dissonance. Yeah, cognitive dissonance is this idea that you're so stuck in the, the, the bullshit that even when you present it with the truth, you cannot accept it because it, it, it will destroy your sense of what you know in this world, your sense of privilege. Yeah. But let's look at some questions about history and science, and we're going to get into this. We should all recognize we are all mutations of Africa. We are all Africa's children in different ways. This has been proven over and over again. And of course, more recently with the Human Genome Project and DNA, it is clear we are all so-called African. Now, why would that even be radical today? That's the question I ask. Why do people get uncomfortable? Why do people try to even deny this? It's because of the sickness that has been put into our brains and hearts. And so we look at some mythologies. Here's the perfect mythology. Yeah, if I ask the question, who built the pyramids? Well, we get the Hollywood version. I know you guys kind of really see there. You get the Charlton Heston and the Yul Brynner. Yeah, Moses and Ramses. And you have this whole history constructed, portrayed in Hollywood, the story of Moses, and of course, dealing with the question of building of the pyramids. And so the question, of course, is why, why is, why you got to lie about the building of the pyramids? What's, what's so important about the pyramids? Why are the pyramids important to world history? What do they represent? Ingenuity, technology, brilliance, high civilization. The cradle of civilization. Exactly. And so let's go find out exactly, well, if I ask the question, who built the pyramids? Of course, we should realize they were built by the Egyptians. Now, all you got to do is look at the millions, <laughs> I mean, millions, thousands and thousands of paintings and carvings in Egypt within areas surrounding the pyramids and the various sacred sites. And they all look like Denzel Washington over there. Pretty clear. None of them look like Yul Brynner. Not one. Not one looks like Charlton Heston. Not one. Yet we accept that. We don't, I mean, we should be giggling when we see pictures like that. We should never allow that untruth to be told. And actually, some of you can see here, but if you look on the right side, it's actually a National Geographic picture. Even the National Geographic had to admit that the Pyramids were built by so-called black pharaohs. And we can look at, I'm just going to run through. I know you guys cannot really see. As you can see, I mean, you know, this is like, uh, I mean, it's not like light-skinned Africans you're talking. And we should realize, of course, in the story of Moses, where was Moses found? Uh, which river? The Nile River. Right? Moses comes from the Nile River. Where is the Nile River? In Egypt, where is Egypt? Africa. I'm here to tell you, Moses is African. Period. Period. Simple. But yet, you still get people. But Egypt isn't really Africa, huh? 
What do you mean Egypt isn't really Africa? Why are you still afraid to accept that you, why would you even think that Egypt would, say, who's trying to empower and disempower the story? That's the question. We can talk about the Great Pyramid of Giza. The tallest building for over 4,000 years. The tallest building. It took them over 4,000 years before they could construct something like the pyramid. That's how more far advanced the technology and architecture and the sciences and the maths of the Egyptians were. And we know who it was built for. There is Khufu. Yeah. And we can talk about other issues. When you look biblically, look at Genesis. What's the first land that's mentioned in Genesis? They talk about the land of Cush. Sometimes spelled with a C, sometimes spelled with a K. In fact, Moses, his wife is Cushite. He marries a Cushite. His children are Cushite. And where is this land of Cush? Some of my students should know. I hope you guys remember. Where is this land of Cushite? Actually, the Cushite, sorry, my map can't really see, but the Cushite lands today would be between Ethiopia and Sudan. That's the land of Cush. You still hoping for other evidence? You don't have one pyramid in Europe. You don't have one sphinx in Europe. Not one. But you find throughout Africa, Sudan, in fact, Sudan has more pyramids than, Ethiopia, sorry, than Egypt. Ethiopia has pyramids. And we still believe it was the Europeans that built the pyramids? Come on, somebody better educate themselves about this stuff. Check out this stuff. Where is this? They had a Luxor well. Which Luxor? Though? Not the one in Egypt. So they take the, the story of Luxor in Egypt. They go to Vegas and build the Luxor and check out their Sphinx. We should look at this and we should be laughing at this. This is incredibly stupid in regards to history. There has never been a history of a Sphinx looking like this except the one in Las Vegas. That's it. And the question you got to ask is, why did they have to make the forgery? What is the purpose of making the fake one? See, that's the question we should be asking. Why not make the real one? Because again, it empowers and disempowers. My point of this, the history that most of us know is this kind of history. The ideas that have been put in our head are these kinds of ideas. This is what has tainted the way we think. And this is, I would say, before, you know, as we start to dream, dream, and dream, we got to make sure we take out this poison from our brains. I'm going to just move real quickly. Of course, Luxor, and you would want to cheat. I wonder how come the Egyptians was copying the, um, the Washington Monument. Of course, we realize the Washington Monument is built off of the Egyptians. Yeah. Yeah, so I could just run through some of these real quickly. Of course, Cleopatra. Yeah, you get the movie, the Hollywood movie again, Cleopatra, but you can see an image of Cleopatra on the right. And yes, she has dreadlocks. Now, want to be Cleopatra, she was sup supposedly of mixed heritage too. Now, by this time, because the Assyrians came in in 600 BC, so Egypt by this time, the Greeks had already come in, so she was a kind of a mixture. But let's think about age. I want you guys to think about this. Cleopatra. Long time ago, right? Long time. A lot of history from Cleopatra's time to now. Tons of stuff has happened. Our connection in time to Cleopatra is closer, is closer from Cleopatra to when the Pyramid of Giza was built. I want you guys to think about that in time. The Pyramid was built 2,500 years before Cleopatra even walked the earth. That's how much history we're talking about in regards to Egypt. That's how much history is actually denied. You know, of course, Africa is the homeland. I'm going to move real quick. I'm sorry. Eh? We can look at other religious figures. I mean, you know, can I really see this question? Of course, this is the Vin Da Vinci painting of the Last Supper. And the Last Supper's painting, of course, was painted in about 1,500 years after the fact. 1,500 years after the fact. And people still look at this picture and they think that there's something like on Kodak moment. This is unreal. 
image of what occurred? Of course not. Of course not. This picture here, of course, the one in the middle looks like Bob Marley and his crew. This picture, or this drawing, I should say, was done 1,200 years before, before Da Vinci. This is done 1,200 years before Da Vinci. And you still think Jesus was blue-eyed and blonde hair? You see that poison? It's like, again, you're looking at the images just like that Pharaoh in Las Vegas. No difference. We can look at other religions, whether it's Hindu. We can look at Buddha. And as you look at even those so-called religions, the most earliest images are also dark African-looking images. We can look at images, of course, of the question of who discovered America. The myth of discovery is the same myth that comes to Hawaii. And I will share this story. I used to go out to all the schools and I would talk. And the first question I would ask the students is, who discovered Hawaii? And many times, what would they say, you think? Captain Cook! You see that blue-eyed pharaoh history again? Of course not. We are already here for a long, long time. When the Americas supposedly was discovered by Columbus, there were millions of people, the Americas, already living there. But the mythology of discovery is one of empowerment. We can think about Columbus and his, and his horrific things that he had performed. And I don't have time to go through this whole question, but go look up Bartolome de las Casas if you understand the history of Columbus. And they gave him even a holiday where they would feed babies to the dogs, cut off people's ears and arms, starve them and bury them alive. And one of the famous things they like to do was to hang them and if I can roast them <coughs> over fires. This of course has all been documented by the Spanish themselves of what they did. We can talk about the myth of Thanksgiving. Right? We all get trained, there was, you know, Plymouth Rock, right? The so-called pilgrims arrive. Went through hardships, and then they met up with the Indians, and then one year later, they had a big feast, pumpkin pie, corn, turkey, and everybody was happy. They all gave thanks. Well, unfortunately, all of that is BS also. None of that actually happened at all. Not true at all. In fact, when you look at the history of the so-called pilgrims, which again, this is chapter two of U.S. history, you'd find you have 20 years after the so-called pilgrims were saved by the Indians, the Peacocks and other Indians from that area, who taught them how to feed to plant, to build, and survive the winters. 20 years later, how do they thank these people? They massacre them, but the hundreds. Things like what's called the Peacock Massacre. I don't have time to go this, but you can go look up William Bradford's prayer on the very first Thanksgiving, the very first Thanksgiving, when he celebrates not just the killing, but the burning of the so-called people in the fires. We know our history, through ancient times, the so-called chiefdoms, or Mo'i, or different Ali. Yeah. And we really had, through the various, yeah, Hawaii Island, Maui, Oahu, and the Kauai and Ihau kingdoms. And we have all these histories that are entwined between our peoples. We, of course, had a traditional society, a class society also, depending on your mana, depending, of course, on your descendancy through genealogy, which also determined uh, your relationship within society. We had, of course, a traditional land system, based upon the environment, based upon cultural practices. Like today, we talk about the Aupua system, you know, which is not just a physical landscape, a geographic landscape, but really an economic and social relationship of sharing within that system. We can look at history, of course, and understand that Captain Cook is given the idea of being the first so-called Westerner or European to come upon these islands. And even when he arrives here, one of the things he read, I don't have time to go the whole story, but you should read his on accounts. They're astounded. As much as the so-called Hawaiians are astounded what they see with Cook and his technologies, Cook and his men are also astounded what they find here. They never found a place that was so clean. They never saw people so healthy. They never came upon a place in which, as they described, the kinds of gardens that existed and farming techniques were virtually from the sea to the mountains was farmed. Where people lived uh, healthier, than any other place they had seen on earth. That's where we come from. Now in comparison to England, of course, what was England like in 1778? 
What was London like in 1778? Huh? That's right. They had open sewers running down the streets. Like, like I said, Cook guys called Hawaiians the most cleanest people they ever met. Now, in places like London, they're lucky they even took a bath once a year. Yeah. Rotten teeth. You can imagine the smells. And yet they call us the savages. One of the things about Hawaiian history you got to understand is the question of depopulation, a mass depopulation that happened here. When Captain Cook comes here, they estimate that they give, Captain King says there were 400,000 people in these islands. And that was a pretty low estimate. But we do know by 1890, by 1890, we're down to 40,000. Virtually 90% depopulation. Today, many demographers and uh, geographers and others who study this kind of stuff say that if you look at the Hawaiian Islands and look at the amount of food that was produced, then in fact, even low estimates would be at things like 800,000 would be a low estimate today. But think about that. At 800,000, in a little more than 100, less than 120 years, we're down to 40,000. That's a 95%. That means for all of us here, who are here in 1770, all of us here, maybe Kyle and I were the only ones that survived. That's what we're talking about in regards to depopulation. And then from just her and I, all of us Kanaka that exist today, we descend from that alone. That's it. That's, we are the survivors in many ways. So one of the things I always say, our lives are not cheap. Yeah. Our lives went through a very horrific time but we are the survivors that are still around. 1810 is when Kamehameha unites the Hawaiian Kingdom, right? He unites the Hawaiian Islands with the ceding of Toei to the Hawaiian Kingdom. We create what now is called the Hawaiian Kingdom or the Kingdom of Hawaii. Now, early on, we should also understand through Vancouver, Kamehameha has this relationship. And in fact, the Hawaiian Islands are ceded verbally to Great Britain and actually in some letters. And this is why, of course, later on, Kamehameha II will travel to, to England. But so uh, for a short time, Hawaii saw ourselves, in fact, as being part of the British Empire. And uh, there's some good stories about that, but unfortunately, we don't have time. You got to come take the class and you can hear all those good stories. Yeah. But Kamehameha I, of course, the great conqueror who unites these islands, yeah, brings forward this kind of uh, uh, taking from the old the so-called pre holy world, and he's going to infuse and try to survive into the so-called new ha holy world while death and depopulation is occurring. Yeah, dealing with issues, of course, of different countries and different ships coming in, trading, alcohol, and all those kinds of vices that come along. Yeah. Unfortunately, he dies, and when he dies, his, uh, his son, his highest-ranking son, Liho Liho, becomes the so-called Mo'i, the king. And along with him, Kamehameha's favorite wahine has said, his favorite wife, Kahumanu, who had no children, who actually raised Liho Liho. She declares, of course, everybody knew that Kamehameha wanted, he, wanted her to jointly rule, and she appoints herself Kuhina Nui, and there is a joint rulership. But I want us guys to understand from early on, the role of women, in fact, in Hawaiian politics from early on, wasn't one of staying outside but in fact, many times was right in center. And so Kahumanu is a very interesting figure. There was no figure like her in the United States at the same time, not at all. Yeah. And they joined the rule. Unfortunately, when Liho Liho and his wife Kamamalu take a trip to England, right? They go to London because now they're gonna they wanna clarify this relationship. In fact, you see his portrait there. He has the British Admiral Red costume on as part of seeing himself as part of the British Empire. He unfortunately dies with his wife there in 1824 and, and it passes on and the kingdom now passes on to the rule of his younger brother. I don't have time to go through all this story. Well, just to also mention 1820, the first uh, American Board of Commissioners for Foreign Missions at the ABCFM, the missionaries, the Calvinists first arrived in Hawaii. Um, I wish I had time to go through all these things, but anyway. Okay. 
Okay. Um, anyway, yeah, you got to come take one class to get all the missionary stuff here anyway. So. <laughs> but anyway, the mythology, right, they came here because of love. That's what they tell us. Well, you should actually read what they wrote and what they said and what they called us and what they thought of us and might change your mind and how they saw us. In fact, you can look at this word here. What can I say? It says, um, designed to bring the Saxon race. So who's the Saxon race? Into supplant the native. What does the word supplant mean? That's the missionaries. They never come to live amongst us. They came to supplant us. Now, if you get issues with your church, you go talk to them. That's your issue. That's not mine. I'm telling you, this is what they said, you know. Maybe a different, uh, they changed their mind, but that's what they were here for. 1825, Kamehameha III, of course, the royal residence is in Lahaina, right? Uh, and um, the capital of Kamehameha III comes to rule. He's the first, what you would think of, a kind of modern, educated young Hawaiian. Uh, he, he's educated by uh, William Richards, one of the early missionaries who actually is buried at uh, Wyola Church. You can go and see his uh, grave there. Uh, he's really the transitional mo'i. The greatest change that happened in Hawaii happens during his reign. Um, he along rules with his, his uh, again, his mother, his Hanai Ma, who is uh, Kahumanu, who's still the Queen Anui. Some of the things he does, he transitions Hawaii from being an absolute monarchy to a constitutional monarchy. He also is the one who brings in compulsory education. Yeah, whereby every child between the ages of 4 and 15 had to go to school. And of course, this led to Hawaii to be seen, in fact, if not the, one of the highest places at that time, highest literacy rate that you'd find anywhere in the world. And part of it has to do, with, of course, with the fact that who was education for? Everybody. Now, let's go measure. Who was education for in the United States in 1825? Only the wealthy. How about England? Only the wealthy. How about the French? Only the wealthy. So what you guys to understand, we were the progressives when it comes to social uh, movements and to understanding the rights of all peoples to be educated. We were not following them. They ended up following us. See, that's the point. In 1826, in fact, it was the first time we had a treaty with the United States, a treaty of friendship. So are we, this is where we formally began our relationship with the United States in 1826. Um, in 1839, one of the more important cornerstones of our history, of course, this is the passing of what becomes the Declaration of Rights. This is the formation of the, the Hawaiian authority, Hawaiian governance being put onto paper. Yeah. Now, at this time, Hawaiians had this very close association still with Great Britain. And there was this lot of, in fact, that's why we had in the structure of governance very much the same kind of governing structure that they had in England in many ways. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> one of the important points of the Declaration of Rights was, in fact, the acknowledgement of three classes of people, or three classes of people who had, the word is, vested rights into all lands. And this is an important part of history where Kamehameha III, unlike other monarchs, gave up his total interest and ownership in all the land and said, now, the land belongs to all of us. This was really a, a revolution without bloodshed in which the Mo'i gives all the Maka'ainana vested rights in the land. Now, this is a very important concept because you can see from the very foundation, the land belonged to all of us. And you got to go look up the meaning of vested too, kind of, you know, time to go through this. 1840 was a Hawaii constitution. So from 1840 on, we are now a constitutional government. Also, off of the idea of the vested rights, we set up the, the legislature, the executive branch, of course, judiciary. But another part of this declaration that all land held in common. Which land? All land. What all land mean? All land means all land. Pretty clear. Again, vested rights of the so-called native tenants. Now, I have Kekawa Nohi, an image of Kekawa Nohi here, a granddaughter of Kamehameha. And that's because she, in fact, was the Kuhina Nui at this time. Yeah, and had passed on from Kahumanu to Kinau and eventually to her. And what's important, in the 1840 Hawaiian Kingdom Constitution, it was a woman who signed off 
for the government. Pretty progressive, again, in world history to understand this. This is followed by the 1843 Paulette Affair. Yeah, this is when the U.S., uh, sorry, the British will take over Hawaii for about six months. And I don't, sorry, I don't have time to go through all this history, but again, the idea is that the British will control Hawaii for about six months. There's a dispute over the uh, control of some lands that some British subjects are claiming to own. But of course, at this point, they had no rights to ownership of those lands. And through gunboat diplomacy, they threatened the kingdom, Kamehameha III, will cede his authority to the British government until they go and fix this situation. Now, meanwhile, while this is going on, this is when, of course, uh, Kamehameha III has always already sent out three emissaries early in 1842. Yeah, this is uh, Sir George Simpson, William Richards, and of course, Timoteo. Oh, I get the wrong hat on today. Timoteo Haalilio. Yeah. And it's, I, don't, I wish I had a whole time to tell you the story, but I'll just share a little bit about, you know, when, when you actually read some of Ha'alilio stuff, it's kind of sad in many ways. When he leaves, you can kind of tell he's worried. In fact, he's expecting he might not come back again. But he understands this is such an important task in order for Hawaii to survive in the future. Because what's going on in the rest of the Pacific? The British has just taken through the Treaty of Waitangi, I think 1841 or 1840 to take New Zealand. The French are in Tahiti, I think, oh, that's 1841, I think they take Tahiti. The Germans are down in Samoa, the Dutch are cruising around. Everybody's cruising and trying to take parts of the Pacific. And he understands the only way that Hawaii can secure their protection is to have a recognized, um, to have that status of being a recognized nation state, to be part of the family of nations. And this is why he sends out those emissaries. And Timoteo Ha'alilio, of course, as the story goes, you know, his great work, and I wish I had more time to tell the whole story, but they manipulate, basically, they, they um, find ways to organize and kind of like play the great powers to be against each other, coming through with their friends from Belgium, and they organize the French and British to recognize Hawaii's independence. Now, what's astounding about this on November 28, 1843, is that Oh, now we just skipped the wrong story already. <laughs> Is that uh, um, <clears throat> there was no non-European nation states out there? If you think about that, but here's these islands in the middle of the Pacific, find their way to Europe, able to manipulate the situation, and gain the recognition from England and France to recognize our status as a co-equal to those countries in what's called back then as the family of nations. And so from that date on, Hawaii was recognized as a co-equal, as a sovereign and independent nation state. So when we talk about history, we got to be very clear. Hawaiians are not trying to get sovereignty. Sovereignty was something that we already have attained. And again, as we tell the story, it's a lot harder to go someplace new than to return where you were before. It's a very different journey. But through that recognition, and this is a copy, of course, of the Declaration, and there's some copies back there, Hawaii takes its place amongst the family of nations, which have provided Hawaii particular international protections in regards to what sovereign states had. Yeah. And that's why, of course, we have La Kuokua, which celebrates what happened on the date in November 20, 1843. Now, sadly, Timoteo Ha'alilio on the left, on their way back from Europe, supposedly passes on right outside of New York, if I remember right, right outside of the East Coast on a ship. He passes on on his way back to Hawaii. So he never comes back to Hawaii. But his partner, William Richards, eventually comes back. And if you ever go to Wyola Church, you can see William Richards' Um, grave site, and on his grave site is actually a memorial to the fact that they secured Hawaii's independence right there. That's, that's on his grave site. So, I talked about this. 1848 is also the following uh, important event was when we began the process of privatizing the. Of course, this is the Mahele Nui, yeah, where the, the I think there are 256 chief and Konohikis divided up their shares of the islands. Yeah. 
Now in the division of the trust lands, one of the things is very clear. When the Konohiki or chiefs received the lands, it was always, I repeat, always, always, always attached to it was this kind of what's called a condition of title. Yeah, and it's a very important. And of course, those are the words koi no na e no kanaka or koi e no kanaka, which basically means except for the rights. Remember those vested rights again? Of the maka ainana, the so-called native tenants, the hoa aina. And so what it meant really was if I was an ali'i and I was given through the mahele, I got all of Wailuku. Well, I didn't actually own all of Wailuku. I owned all of Wailuku except for what belonged and what could be claimed by the so-called native tenants and their rights. Now, this is the thing to understand. Our system was not a copy of the British system. Our system was not a copy of what was happening in the United States. Our system really was one that kind of came from a very Hawaiian worldview that incorporated kind of European ideas of private property. And this is an important point because a lot of times what people falsely believe is how they did it in the United States is how we were doing it here. And again, those are two very different stories. One thing you can see that's very different, in Hawaii, who had ownership in all lands again? The, the native tenants. You don't find that in Massachusetts. You don't find that in Minnesota. You don't find it in California. You don't find it in London or England or France, but you find it in Hawaii. That's one thing that's very different to remember. Yeah. The native tenant claim, and this is of course people know of what becomes the Kuliana Act later on, and um, of course the idea is that they have a full, a right to full use, again, full use of the so-called Ahupua'a. And a lot of times this is where we're struggling today in the courts is to guarantee what does that mean in regards to having full rights. The Hawaiian Kingdom government, of course, was, was set up during this period and, um, you know, worked uh, amazingly well considering um, its position in the world. We still have even our system of land ownership today is still based upon this old traditional system. Uh, whether it's the moku or the ahupua'a, these are still basically the same land tenure system that we have. We had boards like the land commissioner boards, which that looked over the so-called applications, the LCAs, to confirm titles onto the various uh, claims that came forward. And if the claim was good, it would be offered not just LCA, but many times what's called a royal patent. And really what the royal patent was, was the kind of confirmation of the title. And in fact, what the royal patent usually did was it, it, it um, quieted out the title of the so-called government, the Hawaiian Kingdom government from those shares. If you remember that's the idea, is that Maka'ainana owned the one-third share. The government owned the one-third share also. And so for the government to remove themselves of the share, they would usually um, be paid a, what's called a commutation fee or some kind of uh, trade in land um, in order to pay off the government's rights. This led to the Kulian Act of 1850. It wasn't until 1850 when resident uh, aliens could actually uh, own land. And part of this is to kind of understand, even in Maui, when we look at our old history, we should realize that when we talk about so-called today's ceded lands, yeah, we should always remember these are all lands of the Hawaiian Kingdom and government. And this is a map, if I remember, 1902, I think, this map. No, 1902, sorry, 1903. But you can see all the dark green, those are all Hawaiian Kingdom government lands. And if you notice on the west side, check that out, all around Oluwalu, all the way to the Pali. Those are all lands that belong to our people. Later on, in about 1903, if I remember right, the territory of Hawaii then sold those lands out. And later on, they went down, of course, to Pioneer Mill and to others, and later on has been passed away. But the question is, of course, has always been, how did the territory of Hawaii gain ownership of lands that is sold? Where did their title come from? And that's an important question to always consider. We can always talk about crown lands, and crown lands are lands which always follow the crown. And of course, these are lands that were owned by Lili Kalani at the end of her so-called reign. And these are her private property. And in fact, what's important to know is in 1865, the so-called Hawaiian Kingdom crown lands were made uh, inalienable with the words, uh, henceforth inalienable, yeah, inalienable, and shall descend to the heirs and successors of the Hawaiian crown forever. What does the word forever mean? Forever means forever, pretty simple. And the, what we think about today, a lot of those so-called government lands, again, were lands that were gathered through this commutation. So we think about Hawaiian Kingdom lands. The two big land trusts, of course, are 
the government lands, and what we call the crown lands. We should also take note in 1854, from 1854, our Hawaiian kingdom became a recognized, not just a sovereign nation state, but took on the, the, um, the description of being, having what's called neutrality. Yeah, neutrality meant that, of course, that you wasn't going to take sides between conflicts. What is a neutral country out there we all know about? Switzerland. Switzerland has an army? Not really. Because on the international law, because they're a neutral nation state, just like with World War II, they cannot be used or invaded, used for military purposes. Yeah. Hawaii had that same standing. I should say Hawaii still has that same standing from 1854 on. And interesting enough, of course, it had to be connected with what's called the Crimean War. But it's important status. When people question us, well, how are you going to defend ourselves? See, that was the plan. We wasn't supposed to really be defending ourselves. We weren't supposed to have this great big army because we were a new law. Kamehameha IV comes to power in 1854 along with his wife, Queen Emma. And he doesn't rule for too long, but unfortunately, um, you know, when, he, when he, he has a child who's named Prince Albert, Kaleopapa, and, you know, that was going to become the heir to the throne, and of course he passes on very young. His wife, Queen Emma, um, along with Kamehameha IV, they're the ones who, of course, go out into the community and raise funds and monies and using their own lands to support what becomes so-called the Queen's Hospital. And so the Queen's Hospital system was founded and funded by Kamehameha IV and Queen Emma to provide the Kanaka with health care, free health care. Because part of that also was funded by our people. Yeah. So it went from being a health care system that would serve everybody to one now where it's a private investment firm with a private hospital. We got to go figure that one out. And we wish I had more time to talk about that, but come to my class. 19, uh, sorry, 1863, Kamehameha V, the older brother of Le Alexander Liho Liho, he comes to reign. An important part of his history, of course, is what's called the 1864 Constitution that he promulgates. And unfortunately, he dies without naming an heir. And, um, and this puts us to follow at that time, following the constitutional guidelines, was to have an election. And so you have Hawaii's first elected king, Queen, I'm uh, sorry, Queen, King William Luna Lilo, who uh, people call, of course, the People's King. And in fact, on his coronation day and his, you know, his day when he started his job as king, the story, he's walking barefoot in his parade with some ladies right down Honolulu, right down King Street. And this is why, of course, when he dies, he doesn't want to be buried with the rest of the Kamehamehas at the Royal Mausoleum, but wants to be near the people. In fact, that's why he's buried right across the palace at Kauai Ha'o grounds, right in the front there also. He dies, and there's another election, and this time there's a runoff election between Queen Emma, so Queen Emma and Kalakaua, and Kalakaua wins the election. It's an interesting time. Kalakaua is kind of seen as a pro-American um, representative, while Queen Emma is seen as a pro-British representative. Um, when they do a vote, the allegations was they stuffed the ballot, and <laughs> this is how Kalakaua won. There's a right in Honolulu, in fact, where some people actually die over that question. And really, this is when Kalakaua starts to take on that role as the important role as the leader of the kingdom, which is a separate from the so-called Kamehamehas, because Kalakaua, again, is not a, really a Kamehameha. He's related to the Kamehamehas, but he's not a Kamehameha. He comes from a different genealogy. But what's important about Kalakaua, of course, is that he's seen as being very, very pro-Hawaiian in many ways, very much into Hawaiian spirituality, religion, and history. Very much into modernization and uh, technology. Um, of course, international relations, but even in technology, as we all should know. Right? We look at things like the Iolani Palace. We had electricity in our capital before the White House. We had a flushing toilet in our palace before the White House. Not the other way around. We always got to tell the story, right? Who's leading who again? We also know when it came to travels, Kalakaua did some amazing jobs also. When he travels to the um, United States, to America, to negotiate what becomes a treaty uh, reciprocity. 
And at first, people believe that ah, he won't be able to pull it off, but he does. He pulls off these this, uh, negotiations, which basically allows Hawaiian sugar to enter duty-free into the United States. And he comes back with his so-called treaty of, of reciprocity. In 1881, Kalakaua, the first head of state, president, prime minister, king, queen, is the first to circumnavigate, to travel the, girl, the, the world, to go around the world. It was a Hawaiian leader who did this. He also helps to set up a lot of what becomes the international relations, including things like the International Postal Service. Starts with people like Kalakaua. So do we have a role to play internationally? Damn straight. This is nothing new for our people. That's the point. We have always been international. And I would argue we were the first to be international. Even his coronation, Kalakaua comes back and says, well, in Europe, I saw all the great powerful chiefs and, I'm sorry, kings and queens all had palaces. I build my own. He builds his own. They have crowns. He made a crown for himself. And in fact, he does a coronation ceremony for himself where so he basically crowns himself. Anybody seen the Kalakaua crown? Anybody got to see them? What gave in the front over there? Kalo. The Kalo, yeah. Check them out. This one is Hawaiian. He wasn't copying. You look right in the middle of the crown. He's on, he's on Haloa right there. See, that's, that's the thing to remember. Even Kalakaua. They get this idea, oh, he was a buffoon who was trying to cop. No, he wasn't really. He was Hawaiianizing things in his way as he saw them. He was never a follower himself. He was a doer and leader. And people don't realize he hung around with people like Alexander Graham Bell and Thomas Edison and all the supposed great minds of the day. That's who he ran around with. And he never saw himself as being less than any of them. So when he throws his coronation ceremony, as you can see depicted in some of the, the images, they party down, they say, for one whole week. One whole week they party down. And this is, of course, when he brings out all things like the hula that was kind of kept in the back rooms, and he brings it up right up front again in this celebration, blowing the minds of the missionary descendants of that time who had taught. And they said, we thought we got rid of all those heathen things. And damn it, here comes Kalakaua bringing all that stuff back again. In fact, Kalakaua, of course, his famous motto, which are program here, Hawaiian Studies, Studies program is named after, which is a ho'olu lahui. Ho'olu, to increase, to grow, to raise. Lahui, the people, the nation. That was his so-called motto, which really meant, you know, we need to raise our people. The numbers of our people, which were being decimated at that time. Invigorate the race. But he also, what he also meant was invigorate what makes us Hawaiian. Those things, it's cultural things like the hula that we had to raise. Unfortunately, 1887, you have the Bayonet Constitution, and it's a constitution that's, that's forced upon Kalakaua, which, synopsis, takes away a lot of the voting rights from many of our maka'ainana, people of the land, the Hawaiian people who were uh, voting participants. Now, they put on uh, restrictions that you had to have enough money, you had to own some land in order to vote. At the same time, they said, you don't even have to be a Hawaiian citizen, but if you got cash and you own some land in Hawaii, you can vote. So you can see who was uh, empowered in this. A lot of times we talk about this as being like the first half of the overthrow. This is the setup. The same powers, the same people that, that were involved with the overthrow were involved, of course, with forcing Kalakaua as the name, the Bayonet Constitution is, is, is named to, uh, to sign off on this so-called illegal constitution. And I'm sorry, just to, just, said, just to be clear, there were actually five uprisings, and some were, in fact, violent uprisings. They were attempted to actually get rid of this constitution, led by people like Wilcox. Yeah. 1891, after Kalakaua dies in San Francisco, another sad story. They sent him over there to, of course, to, to get healthy. He ends up dying. Um, before he dies, they actually bring to him a recording machine, one of those wax recorders, where he actually tapes his voice. There's actually a recording of Kalakaua, and I actually heard it before, but it's just, you kind of really, you couldn't really tell what it said. My, what I was told was, it had been played so much, this wax cylinder, it doesn't, it's hard to tell exactly what's said. But what I was told is he says something to the effect of like, tell the people I love them and I tried, you know, and he passes on. While his name sister, Lili Okani, she comes to power in 1891, 
the first thing she's asked to do by the people as she goes around, the first thing she does is takes a trip around, a tour around the islands, and over and over the people tell her, we got to get rid of that bayonet constitution. We got to return and restore our rights as a people, the right to vote. And this leads her to want to promulgate a new constitution. And she, of course, has those famous words, the voice of the people is the voice of God. And the voice of the people is the voice of God. However, in 1893, yeah, the act of so-called act of war, the United States conspires with John L. Stevens, the representative, works along with people like Sanford B. Dole and, and uh, Lauren Thurston and those of what's called the Committee of Public Safety to overthrow the so-called Hawaiian Kingdom government and to quickly replace that government and to have Hawaii annexed to the United States quickly. And their plan, of course, why annexation to the United States? Because of economic interest. Their goal, of course, was to recreate that opportunity for them to ship their sugar at that time so they could get more wealthy to the United States duty-free uh, to, to, of course, grow their own pocketbook. Yeah. Another big issue that was going on at the same time from the late 80s in negotiating, when Kalakau was trying to negotiate another treaty, reciprocity treaty, the United States this time had surplus sugar, right? The South, after the Civil War, now are growing their own sugar, so they had less demand, yes, supply and demand, less demand for Hawaiian sugar. And <clears throat> the United States now has more leverage, and they basically say, well, okay, we'll negotiate, but you got to give us Pearl Harbor. And that becomes the issue. The United States wants Pearl Harbor. Why? For military necessity. The United States is already looking out towards so-called new colonies of Asia and the Pacific. The Hawaiians in the Hawaiian Kingdom government, led by people like Navahi, Joseph, uh, um, yeah, Joseph Navahi, um, are very adamant and understand if we give up Pearl Harbor, we're giving up the sovereignty of these islands. And so they knew clearly that was the wrong move. Yeah. Interesting note, Charles Reed Bishop, you know, Pawahi's bishop, banker, Bishop Street Bishop, he was a supporter of giving up uh, Pearl Harbor, just in case he thought he was some big hero, anyway. Um, <clears throat> and so it's a picture of the so-called armed guards that take over Hawaii with John L. Stevens. And I don't have time to go through all of this. I know we're coming to the very end. Uh, one of the things I want to concentrate on are just some of the words here with the so-called overthrow so we can clear up some of the mythologies, again, mythologies that are out there, permeate our brains. And this is the actual statement from Lili Okalani on January 17, 1893. <clears throat> and she said, I, Lili Okalani, by the grace of God and under the constitution of the Hawaiian kingdom. Remember, she's not an absolute monarch. Her powers are limited by the Constitution. Just like the United States President, well, they're not supposed to do whatever they like. I don't know, Trump is a whole different game. <laughs> Their powers are limited by the U.S. Constitution. Right? Let me ask you, could Trump give up the United States if he wanted to? Could Trump say, I sign one pepper, I give him to Putin? Does Trump have that power? Of course not. His power is limited by the Constitution. No different than Lili See, that's when people have the mythology and say, oh, Lili gave up the country. She didn't have the power to give up the country. Her powers are limited constitutionally. Do hereby solemnly protest against any and all acts. So again, this is a protest, yeah? Against myself and the constitutional government of the Hawaiian Kingdom by certain persons claiming. In other words, she's not even recognized. She's just, they're just claiming to establish a provisional government of and for this kingdom. Now, quote, she says, that I yield to the superior force of the United States of America. A very important point. She never cedes her authority to uh, Thurston and Dole and that gang in a provisional government. Never. She never provides them with any means by which they can claim any kind of lawful authority over the government or the lands. Who does she yield her authority? To the United States. It's an important point to remember. And she goes on to say, whose, mi whose minister, Penin Poncheri, His Excellency John L. Stevens has caused U.S. troops to be landed at Honolulu and declared that he would support the provisional government. Okay. 
He goes on to say, now, sorry, she goes on to say, now to avoid any collision of armed forces. She's telling you, why is she doing this? Because it's a good idea? Because it's what's best? She's doing this because a threat of violence. Now to avoid any collision of armed forces and perhaps loss of life. I do this under protest. Meaning what? Willfully? No. And impelled by said force. Yeah? Give me your house. Now, if I got a gun pointed at you and you sign over your house, I think you start to question whether or not that transaction was really legal or not. And she says, impelled by said force, yield my authority. What does she yield? What is her authority? Her authority is limited well, defined in the Hawaiian Constitution. That's what she yields now. She does not yield the Hawaiian Kingdom. She does not yield all the so-called lands. She does not yield the so-called sovereignty of the people. She yields her authority. Until such time. Now what the hell does that mean? Forever? It was only temporary. That's the point. This is a temporary yielding. Very clear. So even if you had made the idea that she gave up the kingdom, she never gave it up for always either. Temporarily. As the government of the United States shall, upon facts being presented to it, undo the actions of its best in Moses. Those same mythologies. That's this. That's what's being used. That's what they argue. This is how Hawaii was taken. But the truth of the matter, if you understand the truth and you understand history and do a little bit of research, you realize this does not have the power. U.S. law only works within the confines of the U.S. territories. Hawaii was not a U.S. territory. In fact, Hawaii had been recognized, already recognized by four treaties with the United States. Four. We actually had over 80 treaties, I think 88 treaties with other countries around the world at that time. Yeah, with all the powers to be at that time. <clears throat> Last couple minutes here. Now, <clears throat> after the, the fake so-called taking of Hawaii, they set up the federal government. And they create what's called the Organic Act, how the U.S. federal government is going to rule Hawaii, basically. And within the, the Organic Act, there's some very interesting things to see. Chapter 2, it says, Territory of Hawaii, that the islands acquired by the United States of America under an act of Congress entitled Joint Resolution to Provide for Annexing Hawaiian Islands to the United States, approved July 7, 18, blah, 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 shall be known as the Territory of Hawaii. Now, I don't have time to go through the arguments, but if you can read, Williamson Chang has a real good article you can find online, Williamson Chang, Williamson Chang, the oldest Hawaiian professor at UH Law School, who talks about this particular issue. But what you find, of course, is that you will never find... <laughs> Documents like this anywhere else. When you claim lands or claim waters, they give you the longitude, the latitude, they tell you exactly the boundaries. What does this say? They don't even name the islands. It just says that the islands are acquired. Well, what islands were acquired? That's the question. That act, the ter that what, what island could it acquire? So that's the question. Not just what did it acquire, but what could that resolution acquire? How does the United States resolution have the power to acquire lands outside of its territory? It does it. And this is the kicker. Number four. Check this one out. It says, all persons who were citizens of the Republic of Hawaii. Of who? Okay, how many of them again? Okay, listen carefully. All persons who were citizens of the Republic of Hawaii on August 12, 1898 are hereby declared to be citizens of the United States 
and citizens of the territory of Hawaii. So who are citizens of the United States? What about everybody else? It has never been mentioned. This is part of the, how come? Well, one thing we recognize, you, how, what, would, what are they gonna say? All citizens of the Hawaiian kingdom are now, they know they cannot do that. You see, there is no legal authority to do that. Now, they could argue that those people wanted to be part of them, but the question has always remained, what about everybody else? And I'm just gonna leave here with this. Some of you might have been there. I remember Hanabusa came here. Uh, she was a congress, no, was she a congressperson? Or she just was out there, I can't remember. She was out that time and for whatever reason, she was doing this tour and connected with, in fact, it was just before the DOI hearings. Just before the DOI, she's gonna come around and she wants to meet the community and talk about something, anyway, I don't know. So a bunch of us, some of you guys remember, we already, um, 103, the, the, our room right there. And she does in this talk, and she's basically saying before the DUI hearings how we should kind of embrace working with um, the Department of Interior. So I'm listening to this, and I'm going, something just felt funny. I knew something was up. My antennas was going wild already. And she's talking, trying to get us to support her and going around meeting all these communities, and you know. And of course, I'm trying to wonder, like, why, what, what's up with that? What's going on? See, we didn't know that they were already planning to bring the DOI hearings to Hawaii at that time. And finally, she was saying things that I knew was just, was just bullshit. I, I just couldn't take it anymore, and so I stand up and I ask her, and I said, can you tell me? And I say, you know, you're a congressperson. You are the former speaker of the Senate. She's a lawyer. She's an attorney. Obviously, a very intelligent person. I ask her, can you tell me when and by what instrument that we Hawaiian people became American citizens. When did we become Americans? And she answers, doesn't really answer. She kind of talks about everything else and talks, talks, talks. Doesn't answer. So I raise my hand again. I said, well, let me ask you again. <laughs> what year and by what instrument? And again, she talks, talks, and she kind of goes off. You guys should do this and this. Doesn't answer again. So now I know either she doesn't know the answer or she knows the answer and doesn't want to tell the answer. So I asked her again, I said, and I said something like, well, either you don't know or you know, and that's why you don't want to answer. But let me just be clear, let me just ask you, what year, what year did Hawaiians become US citizens? And she took a while, she kind of thought about it, and she goes, oh, 1959. And I went, 19, so you mean before, so now, because now that's a problematic now with things before 1950. And in 1959, it's a whole other issue. And you could tell in her eyes, like she knew something was up. Now we didn't know, of course. My point is, when you ask them directly, and this is what we all need to do, over and over and over. We don't have the sword, but we got the truth, you see. We may not have the physical power, but we still got the truth. The question is, are we strong enough to keep on asking those questions? And the truth is people like Hanabusa cannot answer those questions. I don't think Governor Ige can answer those questions. I don't think the, well, the new elected mayor of Maui can answer those questions. Why? Because there is no answer to that question. And that is the truth. And see, that's why it's so important as we educate ourselves. We all educate ourselves. We also must use this education in ways to challenge those mythologies. We should constantly challenge. We cannot accept. We cannot go to, well, I've never been to Las Vegas a long time, and look at those, that blue-eyed uh, sphinx and, and not giggle. You should realize these are all falsehoods, which all, again, empower and disempower. That is the purpose. They will tell these stories based upon non-truths in order to protect and empower themselves, which means it disempowers us, you see. And that's the bottom line. And I believe the only way we can turn this is by using education, is by using events like this, by spreading the truth, by constantly taking these ideas, by constantly making or remaking heroes out of people like Timoteo Ha'alilio. Because it's a different world. 
And I know this next presentation I'm looking forward to coming up is part of this new world. We no longer just look to Washington, D.C. and go, oh, please help us out. We realize we are not bound by just what happens in Washington, D.C. We have never been bound in this way. Just like Kalakaua. And I would argue just like our ancestors. Just like our ancestors. It wasn't just by chance they ended up here. Yeah. They purposely planned and organized, were courageous, had the skills, did whatever was necessary. They were the can-do kind of thinkers. And so I'm, I'm the kind of belief, I don't believe in kind of mediocrity. I don't believe that, you know, we should just be settled for whatever we can get. Because I, know a, I can argue, and say, we don't come from those kinds of people. We weren't satisfied just hanging down there while everybody went out. We were the ones who were pushing the limits. We come from that kind of history. And so either we continue that history or we forget that history. And that, in fact, is something that we are all empowered to decide for ourselves what to do with that information. So anyway, with that, mahalo nui, giving you time and stuff, and um, Kahele can um, introduce.